Hi everyone, welcome to Front End Center, a new screencast series on front end technologies, tools, and techniques for web professionals. My name is Glenn, and today we'll be talking about Webpack. Now, Webpack is one of the most contentious pieces of the modern front end toolchain. It's come in for its fair share of criticism, mainly because it's seen as a big part of the increase in complexity in front end web development. And while it's certainly not the easiest thing to use, I think people miss that it's conceptually quite simple. So I wanted to look at it from first principles and hopefully convey why I think it's so useful and that it, or something like it, will be a worthwhile part of the front-end landscape for the foreseeable future. So here's our starting point. We have a super simple website with a character called Mr. Crocodile who opens his mouth when you click him. Looking at the file structure, we can see we've got a few assets. A background image, a couple of SVGs, a single JavaScript file for the event handling and animation, and a handful of CSS files. We're also including the Snap SVG library to make things a bit easier. In fact, Mr. Crocodile is actually the Snap SVG mascot, and the animation code is borrowed from one of their demos. It's a great library, and they've got plenty of cool demos, so I encourage you to check it out. Looking at our index.html file, we see that we're simply including our main CSS file, which is then including all the others using at import. We have a little bit of markup, including an SVG image for the down arrow. Uh, then we include the Snap SVG library, then our own main.js, all pretty straightforward. Inside main.js, we're going off and using snap to asynchronously load the crocodile.svg file, then inject that into the DOM and attach our event handlers. Uh, taking a look at the network tab when we load this, we can see we're making a bunch of requests, but it's hard to see any detail right now because we're on a local connection. Obviously, our customers are going to be on a variety of different network conditions, and Chrome's DevTools let us choose a bunch of predefined options to simulate that, mostly related to mobile devices. However, as an internet user from Australia, I have a very particular set of experiences with the web. That is, even when I'm able to get high-speed internet, many of the sites I use are hosted literally on the other side of the world, so poorly optimized sites are painfully slow. I've made a network condition tab to represent this, with decent bandwidth but terrible latency, so if we refresh, we see a really clear waterfall. The first few assets are all directly referenced in the HTML file, and so they get fetched immediately. Then our main CSS file is parsed, and all of its imports are fetched. Serving CSS this way blocks rendering, which means our JavaScript can't execute yet, even though it's downloaded. Once the CSS has been downloaded, the JavaScript can then fire and download the SVG, and those two final assets, the background image and the spinner, which are referenced in the CSS, they get loaded. It's a small site, so it only adds up to a few hundred kilobytes and a bit over a second, but hopefully you can see that these kinds of cross-language dependencies from CSS to JavaScript to asset files, etc., can end up compounding, and on bigger projects they can result in pretty significant delays if they're not handled right. This is effectively the sort of problem that Webpack was invented to fix. I call Webpack an ahead-of-time compiler for the browser. That is, it does the same thing a browser is going to do. Parse files, figure out that x bit of CSS references y image, that z bit of JS depends on a bunch of others. But it does so in the command line and generates an optimized bundle for the browser. And I, I see a lot of people confused on this point. A lot of people assume that Webpack is something that just runs on your JavaScript code, and that's a pretty natural mistake to make. Uh, if you've been working on the front end for a while, you're probably used to a world where there are JavaScript tools, things like minifiers, linters, compile to JS languages, uh, and then there are CSS tools like SAS or unCSS, postCSS or anything. Then there are tools for optimizing images or other asset types. But a modern site will probably use a bunch of these, and yet most of our existing tools like Grunt and Gulp, they help you build up a bunch of processes that happen to just one type, just to JavaScript or just to CSS or just to images, but not really relate them to each other. Webpack sort of starts from scratch in this respect and follows a graph of dependencies regardless of their file type and tries to build up a complete picture. It's the same thing that a browser is going to do anyway, but the customer on the end of a crappy 3G connection on the other side of the earth will thank you for it. Well, they probably won't thank you, but they'll just have a nicer time and not yell at their device in frustration. That's enough of a win for me. So let's do it. Let's move this graph of assets into Webpack and see what we get. We're going to want to use NPM for this now, so let's initialize our product and accept all the defaults. Then we'll install Webpack as a development dependency. You can install it globally, but I prefer not to, since it's so easy to add an NPM script to call it. If you're not super familiar with NPM scripts, they're great, and I'm using them a bunch. But uh, please hit us up in the comments. We might do an episode for them in the future if, if people are interested. The next step is to create a config file for Webpack to use. This is one of the most criticized parts of Webpack, and I'll admit that this file can be pretty complicated, particularly if you're looking at someone else's boilerplate project. 
but we're gonna start with a blank file and build things up slowly. For the moment, the only thing we need to do is to tell Webpack where our files live. We just have the one input file, our main.js. Uh, for our output, we have to indicate where we're gonna generate the files. I'm gonna make a directory called build. Now, we also have to set a public path property, which maps that to a relative URL pattern. And since our index.html is one directory up from the build directory, we set this as slash build. Then finally, we name our output file, and I'm gonna call it bundle.js. If we fire up npm run build, it'll call webpack and output a file called bundle.js. At the moment, it doesn't know about our dependency on snap SVG or any of our assets, so it really isn't doing anything but we can at least make sure our site still works with this new output file. Mr. Crocodile still snapping his jaws, we're all good. So now we have Webpack set up and ready to go, what can we do with it? Well, first, at the moment, we're just keeping a copy of Snap SVG in a vendor directory and then loading it globally into the page. But Webpack lets us pull this code from NPM just as easily. NPM is, of course, the main repository for back-end code for the Node.js ecosystem, but it's recently become the dominant source for front-end packages as well. And so having a tool like Webpack that integrates so well with it really opens up a huge amount of open source code for your front-end builds. I'm going to install the Snap SVG package and save it as a development dependency, since it's just going to be used in the build step, not in the final output. Uh, if you're building a static web page like this, pretty much everything you use will be a dev dependency. Now we can get rid of the vendor directory entirely and remove it from our HTML as well. In our main.js, we were just assuming that there's this global snap object that will be loaded before our code runs. But now we need to require our dependency explicitly. This require is local to this file, just like in Node, which has the benefit of not leaking globals everywhere, but also making things obvious to the next person who looks at this file, whether that's a teammate or yourself in six months. Running build again, we see our file size has jumped to several hundred kilobytes. That's a good sign. It probably means it worked. Yep, all good. Snap SVG is now being bundled with our own code into a single JS file. It hasn't really bought us anything in terms of performance, but conceptually, we've moved a dependency from being the browser's concern to being Webpacks, and that's a pattern we're going to repeat. Let's tackle that crocodile SVG file. It's being loaded from our main JS, but instead of asking Snap to load it, let's simply require it and see what happens. It explodes. By default, Webpack treats everything as JavaScript, and obviously an SVG isn't valid JavaScript, so things blow up. But this is what's great about Webpack. We have full control over how each file gets loaded, and it lets us handle all sorts of resources. These are called loaders, and for our purposes, we want the URL loader. Let's install it and see how it works. All we need to do is add a section to our config to tell Webpack that any file that ends in .svg needs to go through this URL loader. We can add more config here, but this is enough to get things working again. If we build again and refresh the browser, we see that our crocodile SVG has been replaced by this data URI. What's actually happening is that this require statement is invoking our new URL loader, which during the build loads the SVG file into memory, converts it to base64, and then stores it inside the bundle.js as a data URI. So when this file runs, that data URI gets passed on to Snap, which can load it without having to hit the network. What's cool about this is that neither Snap SVG nor our application code had to be aware that anything was different, but we've been able to inline one of our assets and save a network request. So now we have the tools in place, let's use Webpack to actually improve the overall performance of this site. Looking at this graph, the last assets to render are now the background image and the spinner SVG, which are both referenced from within the CSS. But the CSS itself is taking almost a second to render, and because it's synchronous, it blocks rendering, nothing can happen until it's downloaded. Our bundle.js can't even execute until the CSS is done. That's because we're using add import in our main CSS. And while this lets us break up our styling code into multiple files, it adds an extra round trip into a crucial part of our rendering pipeline. Let's start by getting rid of our reference to main CSS in the HTML and doing the same thing as before. Let's require our CSS file from our JavaScript and see what happens. I'm also going to console log this so we can see what's going on. When we build, we see we have an error. Again, until we tell it differently, Webpack assumes that everything is JavaScript, regardless of the file extension, so I'm going to install the CSS loader and quickly add it to the config. Building again, now we're failing on our background JPEG. 
This is actually a good sign, since it must have successfully parsed the main CSS file and followed this at import to background CSS. And then, since it's never seen a JPEG before, it bails out. For our purposes, we can just treat JPEGs the same as SVGs and put them through the URL loader. And if we build again, it passes. However, our site no longer looks that great. We've removed all of the CSS files from our timeline, but we've also removed them from the document. Those CSS files are being loaded, but they're just being returned into our main JS. They're not being added to the DOM at all. This is one of the more confusing parts of Webpack, where you might think something is a single operation, say loading a CSS file into the document, but Webpack will split that up into two separate loaders, one to load the CSS file and one to inject it into the document. Now, there are some good reasons why this is the case, particularly for CSS, but that'll have to wait for a future episode. For now, we just need to install the missing piece, which is called the style loader, and chain the two loaders together for all of our CSS files. That looks better. In the DOM, instead of using a link tag, which the browser is responsible for loading, the style loader is simply creating style tags and injecting our CSS inside. The network tab now shows that we're down to only six requests, and only three of them actually hit the network, which is pretty good, but you might have noticed a couple of problems. The first is that now we get this flash of unstyled content, when the HTML has been parsed but the bundle.js hasn't injected any styles yet. That was being hidden before because we had synchronous CSS, and it's really the reason that CSS is synchronous to begin with, otherwise you'd see this all the time. We should fix that, but first I want to fix the second problem, which is that we're actually transferring a fair bit more data than we were previously. Comparing it to the original run, we see that we've saved time by eliminating additional network requests, but we've more than doubled the final payload. On different network conditions, those extra bytes may cost us more than we've saved, but thankfully it's an easy fix. Most of the additional file size is simply down to the fact that the snap SVG file we had copied into our vendor directory was already minified, but the one from npm isn't. By adding the dash p flag to our webpack step, we can tell it to run in production mode, which runs uglify and compresses our bundle. It makes our output a bit noisy, but it's brought down our final transferred size to within about 50 kilobytes of the original version. Webpack lets us do more things to optimize this, but this is good enough for now. Now, as for the flash of unstyled content, we have a couple of options. We could move all this markup into the JavaScript and have it render it out once it's loaded. That'd solve our unstyled content problem, but it seems unnecessary. It doesn't seem to bias anything the way that moving our CSS or assets into Webpack did. It just adds complexity. We could also add a class to the HTML and some inline styles to hide things, and then remove the class when the JavaScript loads, but again, that seems like overkill. Thankfully, there's a simpler way. Remember that this problem only manifested itself when we stopped using render blocking CSS in the head tag, so that content now doesn't have to wait for anything to display. But scripts block rendering as well, both while they're being downloaded and while they're being executed. We just, by convention, put them at the bottom of the document to avoid that, and because usually they're independent of both the styling and the content. The solution for us then is to simply move the script tag into the head. Now, using its render blocking nature deliberately, the way we were using CSS's render blocking behavior accidentally. This is the sort of thing you might have been told never to do. In fact, Google PageSpeed will warn you about synchronous script tags in the head. But as long as you understand what the browser is doing and the trade-offs about serving code in different ways, I say use whatever technique makes the most sense. Now, we've really only scratched the surface here. Webpack has so much more we could talk about. It's got a whole built-in development server, which we haven't even looked at. The concept of hot reloading or hot module replacement in development, which is a topic all to itself. There's a lot more to say with regards to production optimization, in particular splitting out and lazily loading multiple bundles, as well as getting under the hood and writing our own loaders to automate certain tasks. We'd like to make videos on all these topics in future. So if you like this episode, please let us know. Subscribe here on YouTube or leave us a comment about what topics you'd like to see or go to our website at frontend.center and sign up. Thanks for watching.